In my opinion, great architecture and art requires a highly self-disciplined architect or artist, one that can apply his or her rules of meaningful order to create new, beautiful creations. After the First World War, the rules of design were discarded along with the old world order. The resulting church design was twofold. Either a church was a product of a well, self-disciplined design, refined as a continuum of centuries of development, or unfortunately, a church became the product of an ill-disciplined, pragmatic approach, providing not much more than an awkward, ill-proportioned structure for worship. In other words, churches oftentimes cease to be the elegant religious and civic structures they once were. Churches in the hands of ill-disciplined architects became ordinary and oftentimes just plain ugly. There are examples of great, innovative church designs since the First World War. So let's take a look at a few of the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm going to do the contemporary churches. This is kind of fun, but it's also not. It's kind of sad, but it's interesting. I've retitled this, The Rules Are Thrown Out and Oftentimes Is Good Architecture, meaning they tossed out the baby with the bathwater. So I want to go back over the whole thing, and that is the three eras of Western Christian church architecture development. What are those three eras? And first is the Pentecost, the Great Commission, the persecution of Christians, the early house church. Second is the Battle of Milvian Bridge. This is when Constantine defeats Maxentius and declares persecution against the Christians. The Roman Basilica becomes a church prototype. The Basilica form develops, meaning it's developed in Romanesque and then the Gothic and then into Neo Gothic. The Renaissance, man is divine image of God. Reason, Greek Roman temple fronts on the Basilica form as a veneer. These are neoclass become neoclassical churches. But what's interesting is they had to distort these temple fronts because these, built, these basilicas were pretty big. And if you remember me talking about St. Peter's in Rome, it had five temple fronts stepped out from one another, so trying to make it all work as a properly proportioned facade. But behind that was the heart of a church is, and that's the Constantine Basilica. And then we have the Gothic Revival, the return, true Christian architecture. But then we had World War I, and the world changed, and people were just absolutely disgusted with and, fine, and fed up with all the wars they've been having, you know, the... 30 years war and the war, I can't even think of all of them right now, the Franco-Prussian war. And then we have World War I, which was just a mechanized hell. Uh, I think it killed over 8 million people and enough is enough. And so uh, the artist started a movement, which I'll get to in a minute, what happened was they wanted a new way forward. And so the rules of design, meaning these classical design buildings, many times in way of looking at art, uh, were, were discarded. And so their rule was anything goes pretty much. It was, and that created some interesting things, but it also created some bad things because I think good art requires extreme discipline and without this self-discipline, art becomes, it just becomes uh, drivel. So there is disgust and revulsion of the old world order. The old rules of design were thrown out in a search of a new way forward. This is, we've seen this photograph. This is a, a colored postcard of Rennes Cathedral. Uh, you could see its nave was burning. It had been shelled by the Germans. Beautiful building was almost completely destroyed. Towards the end of the 19th century, the rules of design began to change, not because of World War I, that hadn't happened yet, but what was being done were these very hard edge, very realistic paintings that were based on religious and classical themes. And then along came the beginning of Impressionism for soft and, and quick 
and not hard edged. And so the, the way of looking at art began to change. Both of these, I just absolutely love them. Painting on the left is a medieval painting. It's called The Three Marys at the Tomb. And their faces are so expressive. They're holding jars of ointment, I want to say, nard or spices to anoint Christ's body in the tomb. I don't know what this one's called, but I, my guess is it, it could also be Three Marys at the Tomb as well. And this is a Tempanum of Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Very different look at the same theme, but both I think are very effective. So we go from traditional to modern. And that movement that really changed the world, the, the art movement was called Dadaism. You can see Mona Lisa is now sporting a mustache. It was a cultural movement that began in, in neutral Zurich, Switzerland during the First World War involving all the cultural arts, which concentrated its anti-war, anti-bourgeois, anti-nationalist politics through a rejection of the prevailing standards in art through anti-art cultural works. So whenever you look at these Dada paintings or sculptures, keep that in mind that these are really anti-art works and, and art is still going through that phase today. And so you get things like the bicycle wheel. Uh, you can pay 20 euros and, and go into the Pompidou Center and see this in person or save your money. And, um, and then I have three of these exhibits in my garage. It's called Prelude to Broken Arm. By, both these are by Marcel Duchamp. And his most famous one is called Fountain, where he took a urinal and signed it, R. Mutt, 1917, and put it on display. So this is Annie Art as a response to the First World War and its aftermath. Duchamp was famous for his, what they were called ready-mades. In other words, here's a snow shovel, here's a bicycle wheel, here's a urinal. This stuff is still going on today. And then artist by the name of René Magritte in 1928-29, he drew an image of a pipe, but, he, but what he did was significant about it is he says in French that this is not a pipe. And what he was doing is questioning the relationship between words and images. So art started to, I mean, it was a falseness to it, that this is really colors of brown and some black and a, on, on a piece of paper, it's modeled to look like a pipe, but it's not a pipe. That was the kind of the beginning when we started getting these abstract paintings, like you're, you're probably uh, familiar with Mondrian, for example. And Dada had only one rule, and that was never follow any rules. So let's look at what that did to the United States. And anybody that knows what this next building is, please let me know. I think it's Gothic Revival Church. It has pinnacles. But what is it? It has a central tower at the front. It has pointed arch windows. It has a Gothic spire. But what is it? It kind of looks like, I guess, it looked to me like it's a spaceship. But you know, here is a church behind this, this tower, and they put these hedges to clip off the bottom of the church to look like the wings, and then the, they put pinnacles on it. Uh, it looks like a rocket ship. I don't know. Anyway, this is what we're starting to see. I think it was about three or four of these series of slides labeled A, B, C, D, and I said, which one of these are churches? I was doing the the presentation live to an, to an audience at the parish hall. And, you know, it was kind of fun because people would say, oh, uh, you know, A and B are churches and C and D are not. So this time I changed it up and I'm going to give you the answer right now. A, B, C and D are all churches. So you can see that there are no more rules. None of them, in my mind, look like a church or have a churchness to them. So what is it? You know, they're Christian churches. And the same here. Which one of these are churches? The answer is they're all churches. And <laughs> since the last time I did this presentation, I found this one down here, which I think is, it's, there's an onion dome with a cross on top of a tank. That's a church. Anyway, 
pretty crazy. What is it? Contemporary churches. And it's in a way, it's sad to see us get away from what, what a, a church is and can be. Okay, back to something more meaningful and realistic. I want to talk a little bit about the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in, in Washington, D.C. at the Catholic University campus. There's an aerial view. The apse faces north. Jerusalem is, is southeast. So alignment with the apse to the southeast uh, or east isn't as important as it used to be. From their website, this basilica was designed in the Romanesque Byzantine Italianate styles to distinguish from the Gothic Revival style already under construction at the National Cathedral site. So they didn't want to do another like St. Patrick's in Washington, D.C. So they decided they'd go for the Romanesque Byzantine style, meaning the Eastern type of church with Romanesque arches offset bell tower. It's not standing in front or it's not part of twin towers. It's off to the side. Romanesque vaulting, you can see that. And then a typical, not typical, but a Byzantine tiled dome on a colonnaded drum at the crossing. And there's a rose window. And these window elements here and arches are look very much like from Hagia Sophia. And it's kind of fun to go pick out Romanesque, Byzantine, and maybe Gothic elements there. But what it's noted for is its beautiful mosaics, these golden mosaics. What they did was they went to St. Mark's in Venice and looked at that, obviously, because this was called the Gold Church, because of all these mosaics, it's just full of these gold mosaics. It has the domes of heaven, half dome at the end, beautiful mosaics on the pendentives, and the barrel vaults off of the the domes are Romanesque. There's the detail of that beautiful uh, half dome mosaic, which is back here. And then it has these four domes of heaven, cruciform plan, and then they even have some saucer domes or blind domes uh, scattered around uh, as the, the side chapels. So those are the three domes of heaven, and that became the influence for the, the National Shrine in Washington, D.C. Okay, according to the website, Three Isle Basilica, they don't call it a Three Isle Basilica, but they say it has ambulatory on the side aisles. So that's one aisle, two aisles, three aisles, two aisles, and a nave. Basically, this a basilica form, apse at the end, a transept, a crossing, but it's not in the Gothic style. This was started around 1920. So again, they were able to use steel as part of the construction of this to overcome weakness and, and tension in, in stone. Here's a view down the, the nave to the apse and a view at the crossing and saucer domes, these blind domes. They don't have lighting from the top or the sides like the main dome does, the Trinity dome. So there it is. Cruciform plan with the with the main dome, the drum on top of with the dome of heaven on top of that. There's four saucer domes or blind domes, beautifully done in gold mosaic. A barrel vaulting, not pointed, but Romanesque, round arches, and they use the barrel vaults as the transepts. So that whole transept is just a barrel vault on both sides. And then at the apse right here, they have Christ, the majesty, the mosaic, and the north apse terminating the nave view. It's located right here. He's very muscular. He's got flames coming from his, his corona, and he's a very stern-looking person. Okay, the basilica, what I wanted to do was, I missed one here. This shouldn't be showing up right yet. I wanted to take you through the uh, domes. And if you follow this legend down here, dome one, two, three, four, all the way to seven, this is the six and seven are barrel vaults. But anyway, the incarnation is the first dome as you enter right here. The second dome right here is the redemption. The Trinity or the great dome is right here at the crossing followed by the sanctification, descent of the Holy Spirit, and then 
The last dome is the glorification of the Lamb. And then in the transepts, uh, the last judgment barrel vault and the creation barrel vault. And then we have Christ the majesty at the apse end to terminate the nave. In most churches, Christ is usually in the prime position as you enter the church in the tympanum or at, and, and or at the apse end uh, to terminate that long vista down the nave. And if you take the plan and put those domes and vault, barrel vaults in position, you can see how they all relate to one another. If you haven't been there, I'd recommend a trip. It's not too, you know, it's in Northeast Washington uh, on the Catholic University campus. Going abroad in Iceland, there's an interesting church there. I think our youth group was there for service a couple of years ago. What's interesting about that is Iceland is, I'm sure aware, is a volcanic island. And one of the things about volcano geology is depending on where the rock is in relationship to the surface, when it cools, it cools in various different forms like obsidian, which is a smooth black glass-like rock. But in this case, basalt will cool and form hexagonal columns, vertical columns. Sometimes they're tilted depending on if there's been a geologic activity afterwards. Iceland is a volcanic island and these hexagonal columns are around in, in, in natural forms. And so what the architect did, I thought, was a very interesting idea. He took kind of a Gothic church and made it local by emulating these basalt columns, flanking both sides of the entrance and building to a crescendo to the, to the cross at the top. I thought that was a pretty neat use of reference to tie in Christianity and the, and the local uniqueness of the plate. And there's no flying buttresses. Again, this is built in starting in 45. So they had the use of steels, probably a steel frame with, with stone hung on it. So you wouldn't need buttresses, a flying buttresses other than anything for ornament. And it has an apse and it has an et cetera, et cetera, excuse me. And the interior is very severe. It's a Lutheran church, but it does have the pointed Gothic vaults, the groin vaults. There's no triforium. The side aisles go all the way up to the vaulting and back down again. But nevertheless, it has a lot of the elements that we've been looking at, a nave, an altar, an apse, etc. It's a very, very modern interpretation of the traditional Gothic forms. Another interesting chapel, it's non-denominational, is the Air Force Academy Chapel in Colorado Springs. And you can see here in the plan, it is just one large space for worship, non-denominational. The section of it is, there are actually two trusses leaning against each other, covered with aluminum, which is an Air Force chapel, uh, that's what it, their airplanes are covered with. The motif is uh, hands folded in prayer. I think it's worth, worthy of taking a look at it. Keep in mind that if you look at this, you see the, the structural pieces. If you remember something I was talking about in the Gothic cathedrals, that it's just a slice of structure repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. So this is very much like a Gothic cathedral in that there's a section of, of Gothic cathedral that you put next to another section and another section and another section. And that's how they made this aluminum, uh, again, appropriate for the Air Force. And inside, it looks kind of like a, a spaceship or an aircraft or something. And it has stained glass. I find it pretty interesting design for a chapel. Uh, Skidmore Owens and Merrill Big, big uh, Chicago firm, did this years ago, 1962. And here from the outside, you can see how these slices are just repeat. I call them slices like I did in the Gothic. They're just repeated over and over, stuck together. I wanted to also bring to your attention another chapel. It's, in, it's called Notre Dame du Haut in Ronchamp in France, built in 1954. The original Catholic church there was largely destroyed in the Second World War. And so instead of trying to save it, they tore it down. And they had the good fortune 
of hiring the most famous architect in the world at that time, a man by the name of Le Corbusier. His name was really Charles Edouard Genre, but he goes by the name of Le Corbusier. Uh, he did a lot of uh, modern buildings in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and a lot of his work is seen, is copied and seen around the world. This church, in other words, they knocked down the old Gothic church and started from scratch. I've studied this building and looked at it. I've been there twice, talked about it in school. No one ever mentioned to me it's a solar diagram, and I've been looking at it, and I'm going to present it to you as a solar diagram. So take it for what it's worth. No one else may agree with you, but I think I'm going to make a case for it, and its response to the sun is pretty amazing and comes across as a beautiful place to, to worship God. Dominant, unique roof is the uh, from the Daughters of Charity in Paris, and she's wearing, and she's wearing the cornet, or cornet, excuse me, their, their headdress, and he took that and kind of refolded it as an idea for the roof of this, of this church. But what has intrigued me in the past couple of years is what I call the solar wall. It faces south, north is top here, and, but, and this wall faces south. But you'll notice that this roof projects over this wall. And if you do a solar diagram for where the sun is, it, low in the sky in the winter, the sun will peek underneath this roof and hit this thick wall, this mass of masonry. And in the summer, the sun will, in the south, will be at a higher elevation. And this wall, you can see it's casting a little bit of sun. Now, I don't know when this photograph was taken, but this sun in the, in the summertime will descend down the wall during the hot part of the day. So anyway, it's, I think it's an interesting church, and, and bear with me, and I hope you enjoy it. So on the outside, we see, here's photograph A taken from this position, solar wall, there's an altar, there's a pulpit, this is for outdoor worship, how prescient was this? B is taken from this, this is kind of from the northwest side, and you'll notice that there's a gargoyle, and it goes into a canal uh, rain basin, and these are light monitors that provide light going down into their respective chapels. And you'll note they don't face in the same direction. C is kind of the back side of this. And I don't fully understand this part of it. You can see it's a thinner wall. It's on the north side. So the south side has this wall so the sun can strike it. And then overnight, it can emit the stored solar heat into the nave so that it gets some warmth from the previous day's sun when the services are, are held. And this is what it looks like inside. It has this heavy concrete roof. As he raised the roof up off of the wall so that a line of daylight could come in. So this is not like being in this in this room with this big heavy concrete roof on you. The concrete roof literally looks like it it kind of floats above you because because of this slice of daylight that goes around you can see that here it has an altar it, the pews are kind of offset from the altar so you have to kind of look in that direction this is a balcony uh, i think they use for preaching I, i'm not sure i haven't been there for a, a service there is a solar wall this is the inside of the solar wall. Here's another view of that solar wall. You can see it's very thick, and the architect has the head sills and jams splayed to direct light in various places, pieces of stained glass in these windows. Here's the pews again. And here's the plan. I wanted to show you what I got a kick out of this. Here's that thick solar wall. Uh, north is to the top. And there's a morning chapel, a number seven, which is right here. It faces east. So the sunlight comes in the morning. This is looking up the monitor. And then that light comes down into the chapel. Then there's the grand chapel, the largest, number four. It faces north. And that's this piece right here. And that monitor, looking at, up into that monitor, here it is from the outside. These windows right here are these windows, and this 
slot and these openings are, you're seeing them right here with the cross on top. So this is a fairly constant north light that's in the Grand Chapel. And then in the evening chapel, it faces west, and that's right here. So you have an east-facing chapel gathering morning light, and you have an, a west-facing chapel, which is painted red. This is really dramatic to see this in there. It's a lot. I love it. But you can see it faces west. So we have a north-facing chapel, a uh, west-facing, east-facing, and then we have this south-facing solar wall. The next slide will show you how that looks. And also, if you'll notice that this is a stripe of, of sunlight coming across that curved monitor, if you call it. And what happens is as the sun passes during the day, this stripe moves across the top of the vault and then and down the side. Like I said, this, this is just an incredible place to be done by one of the, the, the great architects of all times, Le Corbusier. And so this is what that south wall looks like during a service. And then my question to you is, is this a spiritual mystical place? I'll leave you to answer that yourself. It's not in any way a traditional church. I saw some, I think, silly examples of contemporary church architecture. I may be too harsh on them, but this place was done by a true master at the newest craft. If you get into the southern part of France, it's way, you need a car to get to this place. It's worth a visit. And then my last building is going to be the Thorn Crown Chapel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And I have a little story, I have enough time to tell you, that will demonstrate the difference between engineers and architects. Okay, so this was done by a man named Faye Jones. He was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright's. It's in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, and done in 1980. It's designed to be a chapel in the woods. They would not let any machinery up here to build this. It all had to be hand carried or hand transported, including concrete, stone, and steel members and glass. But they saved the woods. And you can see it has very much like a tree form branching structure to it in this big canopy overhead. It's located over here. Parking is down here. It's in the woods, obviously, and it's kind of out of the way to get to. Here's the plan of it. And just like Air Force Chapel and the Gothic cathedrals, these are slices of structure that are repeated, 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 repeated. You can see them here in the elevation. These slices are repeated. And this is what one slice looks like from the front. And it's basically, it's a very clever truss to form this building in the woods, this very light, light structure, glass and, and frame structure. This is what it looks like inside. I remember when this came out, I wanted to go see it and I had the opportunity. I was doing some work for Walmart and they're not too far from, from this building. And we had to go visit some stores up in this part of the state. This is in the Northern part of Arkansas. And so I said, hey guys, uh, do you think we could stop by Eureka Springs and see Thorn Crown Chapel? And they said, oh yeah, yeah, it's really pretty. And then another one of the engineers, I was traveling, I was the only architect, everybody else in the car is engineers. And they said, yeah, but you know, and this one guy says, you know, there's the best donuts in the whole wide world are nearby. And so we'll stop by the donut place first, have, have some donuts, the world's best donuts and a cup of coffee. And then we'll go see this. And I said, okay. It was in the afternoon. And so we stopped by and, and we're eating donuts and drinking coffee and talking and and I'm saying, you think we could get going and, and see this place? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah let's get going. So we get there uh, out in the middle of nowhere and pull into the parking lot. And they had just pulled the chain across it and it was closed. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> awesome. so I got, <laughs> yeah, tell me. So I got a chance to eat donuts with the best donuts in the world with a bunch of engineers, but uh, they don't care so much about beautiful buildings. So. What can I say? And I know you guys out there are engineers. I'm just tweaking you. So anyway, that was that was my uh, experience. I really I, I'd love to go back and see this. I don't know if I'll ever get a chance. So 
So I wanted in with this thought because we did start with our outdoor service and we've covered 2000 years of history. And I wanted to quote you from a brief history of St. Mark's by Ed Travers. He, he published a few years ago. Having no hall or public space for worship, they tied their horse to a tree and met in Welling Woods, now Simpson Woods, about a mile from the present church site. Reverend Thomas Duncan conducted the services from a crude platform in the congregation, about 30 in number, worship from benches drawn around it. So we've kind of come full circle. This is a beautiful chapel in the woods. It provides comfort from the rain and, and the elements. We've had our outdoor services, and, and in between our outdoor services, you know, there's been 2,000 years of development of Christian architecture. It's produced the finest buildings, some of the finest buildings in the world, and blessed that I studied that as a profession, and hopefully I was able to share some of my knowledge and love of these buildings with you. So thank you so much for attending. I know it's been a long eight weeks. So. With that, I'm going to sign off. Congratulations if you made it through all 13 presentations. I really enjoyed assembling them and hope you found them informative. Please check back from time to time. I'm planning on creating some more presentations about Western architecture. One church that's high on my list is Gaudí's Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. I hope to see you soon. And God bless.